Hello, everyone. I'm Ted Mitchell, the president of ACE, the American Council on Education. And it's my honor to present an award that is near and dear to the heart and mission of ACE, the Reginald Wilson Diversity Leadership Award. The award was established in 2001 by the ACE Board of Directors, and each year, ACE presents the Reginald Wilson Diversity Leadership Award in honor of ACE's Senior Scholar Emeritus, Dr. Reginald Wilson. Sadly, Reggie passed away in December of 2020, but he will be long remembered as a passionate champion of the richness and positive values gained by increasing diversity at our nation's colleges and universities, something that is needed more than has ever been needed in America. Reggie originally joined ACE in 1981 and served as senior scholar from 1998 until his passing last year. Prior to joining ACE, Reggie was president of Wayne County Community College in Detroit for 10 years. He was the author of Think About Our Rights, Civil Liberties in the United States, published in 1998, and served before that as one of the famed Tuskegee Airmen. We're honored to continue to honor Reggie's legacy through this award. And now it's my privilege to announce this year's ACE Reginald Wilson Diversity Leadership Award to Dr. James L. Moore III. James is the Vice Provost for Diversity and Inclusion Chief Diversity Officer at The Ohio State University and also serves as the first Executive Director of the Todd Anthony Bell National Resource Center on the African American Male. James is also the inaugural EHE Distinguished Professor of Urban Education in the College of Education and Human Ecology at The Ohio State University and their travels through the educational process. His research focuses on school counseling, gifted and talented education, urban education, higher education, multicultural education and counseling, and STEM education. He is often quoted and featured in prominent media sources such as the New York Times, the Journal of Blacks in Higher Education, the Chronicle of Higher Education, and diverse issues in higher education. Since 2018, he has been cited by Education Week as one of the 200 most influential scholars and researchers in the United States, a distinction given to those whose work informs educational policy, educational practice, and the need for reform. James co-founded the International Colloquium on Black Males in Education. He's co-edited edited several books and has over 150 refereed publications. He has a national reputation as a thought leader on critical education public policy issues and is regularly invited to share his expertise with variety, a variety of audiences, in K, including K-12 system leaders, K-12 teachers and administrators, post-secondary institutional leaders, professional associations, and even governmental agencies. He has testified before Congress and was invited to give NSF's distinguished lecture for its engineering directorate in 2020. It really is an honor to add James to the list of worthy recipients of the Reginald Wilson Diversity Leadership Award. And even in this virtual moment, I hope that you will join me in congratulating James on his incredible career and his incredible contributions. James, thank you very much. In loving memory of Reginald Wilson and on behalf of ACE and our membership, as well as the many students and others in higher education and beyond who have benefited from your tremendous efforts and your great work, I congratulate you on receiving this very special award. Thanks for being here today. Thank you. So James, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions. You and I had a, a terrific conversation a couple of weeks ago in which you remarked more than once that yours uh, is a journey during which many mentors and friends encouraged you and taught you. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about your journey? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you uh, for surprising me with this esteem honor. And it's one that I don't take lightly. And I think it's more, uh, I am the benefactor of this award, but many, many others deserve much recognition. I will be remiss if I don't start where it all began. 
I'm a native of my beloved South Carolina, a little small town outside of Spartanburg called Lyman. It all began with two people, my mother and my father. It is where I grew up that they told me that I could achieve and that I could dream big. They created a wonderful apparatus for me and they were the original mentors where the love is sound, unconditional and never ending. And so I first and foremost, I wanna acknowledge my parents as well as the village that I grew up in. I grew up in a very uh, uh, common situation in the South but I realized when I traveled and left the domains of my community that it wasn't as common. Actually, my fourth cousins, third cousins, second cousins, first cousins, grandparents and aunts and uncles all lived on the same street. So much of what I've achieved, I realized that um, there weren't any barriers when you grow up on a street like that. But in my journey, I, I must say that you, you don't achieve a lot without the hands of others and the people who impart wisdom, knowledge uh, in you. So as I began to matriculate, uh, as I matriculated in institutions, in my institution of higher learning, Delaware State University, like many young men where I grew up, uh, we thought we were gonna be professional football players. So I went, to college on a, a full football scholarship, uh, thinking that I would be able to reach my dreams and becoming a professional football player. Although I had a great time during that, during my college years, but I sustained a major injury that ruined my possibilities of playing at the next level. But at that time, I came in, uh, in contact with my mentor who really showed me what the possibilities, who said I had immense capability and intellect and that the world was mine. All I had to do was pursue it. Yeah. And his name is Dr. James Scott King, who also hmm. was a native of South Carolina. He would always impart wisdom. He would always mentor. He would always reach out to me and he always would tell me that I was much more than a football player, that I had greater capacity to do any, even much more uh, than I did on the actual playing field. He was the first one who planted the seed that I could be a professor when I really didn't know what it all entailed to be a professor. At Virginia Tech, it was a great experience after leaving Delaware State University um, I owe both of those institutions a lot. I'm a product of an 1890 institution and an 1860 institution, and I certainly value land-grant universities. And uh, being at Ohio State, it's sort of like it reflects that kind of experience uh, for people like me who grew up in working-class communities. Uh, these institutions have done so many things for people like myself. My education has literally transformed the hands I shake, the people I meet, and the places I've been. And, and I, have, I have tremendous uh, respect, and I honor all the mentors who have gotten me up to this point. And hopefully, it's, I'm not at the end. Hopefully, there's even more. Yeah, I, th I, th I, think, I think this is just the first, the first lap of many uh, for you, Dr. Moore. And, and I'll... Uh, I'm moved by your by your by your journey, the story of your journey, and I, I want to you know, take a second to thank your mentors uh, because they clearly have made a, a dramatic impact on you and through you, as you say, um, on every hand you shake, on every student you meet, every word you write. So, to your mentors, uh, uh, please know that you share in this in this award today. Uh, so, so James. Um, you really have had already uh, an extraordinary career. And as, as we both said, there's much more to come. Uh, your work at the Ohio State University has been, been pathbreaking. It really feels like it's, and from all of your nominee, nominators and, and people you've, you've worked with, I mean, they, they really remark on how creative you are as a thinker, uh, how you're able to put uh, important questions into, into context where they're understandable and actionable. 
Um, you're well on your way to creating at The Ohio State University a model for other institutions. Uh, I'm, I'm particularly interested in the International Colloquium on Black Males in Education. Where, where did that idea uh, come from and how has um, an international perspective changed uh, your uh, perspective on your own work and your own campus? As I look and reflect on my own life, I always think about what was it about me that allowed me to continue to ascend while I watched so many people who I loved and care about so deeply uh, that wasn't able to ascend. And there are many explanations. I don't want to suggest that I had the it factor or I had this drive. I, I just like to think I was at the right place at the right time. Uh, and I was able to seize the moment. But nevertheless, I saw the same thing when I went to Delaware State and I tell the story and I reflect on it. Um, in the hallways, I stayed in Mega Evers dorm and you know, on the wing was probably about 30 uh, young men who lived on the same wing and, um, and the lights went out. And so when the lights went out in the dorms in the old days, you had to go in the hallway because they had the emergency lights. So that's the only light that you had. And because it was raining outside, we didn't go outside. And um, so to make a long story short, we were there just talking. And many of us were talking about how fortunate we were and how so many of our friends and peers should be where we are, but they're not. And so homicide rates were very high when I was in college. Um, and Black males, just like now, they weren't faring well in the educational continuum. And out of that, many of us swore when we finished that we were going to try to make a difference. But to make a long story short, I was the only one that graduated, at least at that time that I'm aware of, out of that whole entire wing. I was the only African-American male that graduated. So out of that, I just became just a very interesting in the life of black males. In many ways, like many of the great writers, you really study others to understand yourself, right? right? And so, um, so I, I really became so immersed. And I can tell you at the time, there weren't a lot of scholars, you can almost count on one hand, who really um, did a deep dive and made a focus on black males and education. And so I met a, a, a a group of other scholars who had similar interests. And one of my dear friends and colleagues, uh, jo Dr. Jolando Jackson at the University of Wisconsin, we were working on a paper. And I think it was around mid 2000s. And we were writing on um, males of color beyond the continental divide. And at that time, it was the first time that we had ever recognized, understood that the plight that Black males experience in this country, we were seeing similar things in the UK, in mm. the Caribbean, mm. and other parts of the world. In fact, we discovered uh, that males in general were underachieving and low achieving at high rates throughout the globe. Uh, whether you're talking about in China, whether you're talking about white males in the UK, white males in the United States. And so out of that, we, uh, decided that let's try to galvanize the high impact practitioners, researchers, scholars, and community leaders to see if we can wrap our hands around some of these issues and to be able to uh, deal with the spiraling decline that many of them are experiencing. And so that was the impetus of the International Colloquium on Black Males. We've been abroad every year. We try to go to places where they have some real issues and where we can add value and engage our international community with trying to solve some of the problems locally. Sounds like you've started a, a real international dialogue on one of the key issues of, of our time. And interesting to note and important to note that it is not just a, a, an American issue, but it is, a, it, is a, it is a global issue. You've mentioned a couple of times the, the, the events of the year, and, the, and they are significant. Uh, they really have changed the way, and for the uh, correct reasons and in the right direction, changed the way many of us uh, think about access and success in higher education and really have put a, a focus on uh, 
uh, black students, brown students, uh, low income first generation students in, in a way that I think we've talked about before, but really hadn't gotten down uh, to the to the nitty gritty. And as you talked about your own story and talked about uh, the being in the right place at the right time, having terrific mentors, uh, I know I know from your work and I know from your writing that for you, that's created a, a sort of a mosaic uh, that is a, a, a prescriptive mosaic as well as a descriptive mosaic. And as we think about uh, the success of, uh, of black students and, and brown students, low income students, what do you think if, if, if we, we've sort of flipped the dialogue and you're now talking to a room full of college presidents, what what should they understand about those experiences, about your research? that could help them uh, think through how their institutions can truly serve diversity, equity, and, and inclusion going forward. Sure, and, and I'll, uh, I'll answer your questions focusing specifically on the students because there is a, a right. role the faculty play. And oftentimes universities like Ohio State and, and beyond, we put a tremendous emphasis on the students, but not the faculty, uh, diverse, um, uh, faculty attracts diverse students. Diverse students don't typically attract diverse faculty. And when I talked about mentorship, we know research is highly correlated with the number of contact hours that a student has with his or her teacher or professor. And it's also highly correlated with the relationship. So it's important that relationships really matter. Just like how I describe the relationships of my mentors, they were my instructors and I enjoyed being around them. But you notice they were great instructors, but it's the mentorship. It was what took place outside of the classroom that really shaped my trajectory. It was those, you know, naturally, when you think about it at the PhD level, uh, it's an apprenticeship, right? It's, it's a different kind of relationship. Right. It's more than just taking the courses. It's, it's really just spending time with the professor and engaging in the applied activities uh, of your endeavor. But what I would tell presidents that is quite important, and this is cuts across institutional type, and some of these same factors are true for HBCU institutions too. There's some overlap between all institutional types, but oftentimes the dialogue, we began to really focus on the PWIs, the predominantly white institutions. So I'm gonna kind of talk about some of these things that I think are five things, and it's kind of related to much of my research. And, and they these things shape educational aspirations as well as career um, trajectories. The first thing is interest. How do we get young people interested in academic subject matters? How do we sustain right. one's interests from K to gray? And typically there are tipping points throughout at every level of the educational pipeline even when you have the aptitude, but there are certain kinds of messaging that sometimes make it very difficult for a person to sustain their interests. So interest is a very important thing. Right. The second thing is preparation. Preparation is an issue in our country. And when I say preparation, there's malpractice that is in that is proliferating all throughout. United States. We know all advanced placement is not created equally. We know all gifted and talented programs are not created equally. Uh, you can almost go into any uh, public school in America and you can see vast differences from the suburban schools or even private schools. Uh, that we have to right some of those wrong. And to me, uh, we see malpractice and we have to address it head on and we gotta be uh, honest and sincere because these issues are not just social justice issues. It is an economic imperative that we right some of the wrongs in our public schools if we wanna maintain our global edge. So preparation, there's a degree of preparation that is needed at every level of the continuum. And when you don't have it right now, there's a report that was re recently produced in Ohio and said that you know, about 5%, no matter what school district the kids come from, they're going to experience some gaps in their learning because of the global pandemic. Right. But the most vulnerable school systems where, where we tend to find high uh, numbers of black and brown, low income students, 
they're expecting as much as 50%. How will our presidents address that? What, is, what are the federal implications? I know we have talked about the stimulus, but we need bridge programs to bridge these students immediately, instantly. These are things I've talked to in my government affairs, and these are things, and these things are plaguing all kids in America. Even my own kids in our very, um, uh, you know, insulated suburban community we live in, my kids don't, in, some, some of my kids don't enjoy the online mechanism. And so when you don't enjoy things, you sometimes don't get the full benefit of the educational experience. Uh, because you remember, I said academic achievement is highly correlated with the relationship that you have. And when you don't enjoy it, you're not going to really spend much time with your teacher or the content. The third thing would be experiences. We want students to have experiences indicative of their trajectory or what we would like for them to go. Too many of our kids are not given the opportunities. And, and we see it all throughout the continuum. You can go to Ohio State, UCLA and still not get the same education as everyone else. In theory, you did, because you got a degree and it's, you have a university stamp, but if the experiences is not rich and meaningful, you might have uh, a, a degree, but not necessarily a degree that can allow you to reach all of your dreams and aspirations. The next one would be connections, and it goes back to what I said. We know that uh, the connections with your professors, connections with meaningful mentors, they play a critical role in one's educational and career trajectory. As I just said, academic achievement is highly correlated with that relationship. So uh, some of the most powerful learning takes place in a social context. And when those social contexts are not meaningful or they are unhealthy, you can't expect people to reach optimal levels of success. And how do, we, how do we make institutions as big as Ohio State more personable? How do you bring people together and say, how do we, you know, one of the things we do in our office, because we had over 2,500 students who made the Dean's List, and we're one of the largest, oldest, and most comprehensive office of diversity and inclusion. And what I learned in my research, you can't leave stuff up for chance. And a lot of my research, as you noted, focus on gifted and talented students. Many of the students who matriculated Ohio State, UCLA, Virginia Tech, these students were some of the best and brightest, but that does not mean you're gonna realize your full potential. And we see that even with white males, right? They're more likely to underachieve and lower achieve, but most people are not paying attention to that, even when they have high intellectual capacity, because we leave too much for chance in, in institutions are learning. You say you need to be self-motivated, but we never say that about our football team at Ohio State. Uh, our coach would never say you're a five-star and you don't need to be coached or a four-star, three-star or one-star or no-star. We always coach up. And so what we have a mindset in our office is that we connect opportunities with individuals aspirations we want to eliminate every barrier and what out of that i think we created a community of excellence is what we like to say the ethos of excellence how do we help everybody reach optimal levels of success and that's what we strive and the last thing is opportunities your interests your preparation your experiences your connections determine whether or not you can even access the opportunity there are some things that are presented to students of color, low income, first gen, and they can't access them because sometimes they've taken everything that their little rural or urban school had to offer, but it still wasn't enough. We need universities to think about this. We need to make strategic investments in the places that are hardest to educate young people. And without doing that, our national security, our global edge, all could be compromised. And it has nothing to do that I want to discriminate against uh, white males or white families. It's just based on uh, the shift in demographics. Certain demographic groups are having babies at rates that we've never seen before. And it is changing the demographics of our K-12 system. 
And, but in turn, most of those individuals, when you look at the states, they have the highest free and reduced lunches, but we have the highest minority populations. The, these populations tend to go to some of the most underperforming, uh, under-resourced schools in America. And we really need higher education to play a critical role because they can bring to bear some of the expertise and not only the expertise, we focus on education, we focus on outreach, and we focus on research. And those are the three pillars that I think our country need for helping us advance uh, yeah, uh, the talent pool in our country. Uh, a social responsibility uh, to serve all in this country and particularly to attend to those who have um, not uh, gotten all of the advantages and have had enjoyed enormous, uh, who have not enjoyed the enormous privileges that others have. You mentioned um, educational malpractice a while ago, and I, I think that that's it's important for us to recognize, as as you certainly do in in your work, uh, that uh, challenges not just in K twelve but in higher education do on occasion border on on educational malpractice. I think that your five-part recipe for success is really remarkable, and I, I hope that people uh, will will take note of those because I was just struck as you were talking about how different our institutions would be if they really took those five uh, principles seriously, uh, and especially the one uh, of making institutions more personalized, more accessible. Uh, more engaging for all students, but particularly for students for whom the college experience may be a very, a very foreign, very foreign one. Uh, we could go on. Uh, I, I mentioned before we got on, we probably have three hours worth of, of questions. I think that the, for me, that's grown to five. Let me ask you one, one last question that hopefully can go from the beginning to the end. Uh, you work every day with young people who are in education, who are coming up, who are at different uh, points in, in the journey that, that you've taken, people who are uh, undergraduates who are looking at careers in education, graduate students who are in that apprenticeship that you mentioned for a graduate degree, uh, entry-level student service uh, officers, uh, uh, junior faculty, especially minority faculty who are called on to do so much. Um, uh, what, uh, as, as the recipient of the Reginald Wilson Diversity Award uh, winner, you, you now get to Sort of be avuncular and 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 give a little give a little wisdom. Um, any any words of advice or or thoughts of, of inspiration for people who are uh, still still walking uh, in your footsteps? Well, you know, you know, I like to say I'm a son of the South, and you know, I'm from South Carolina, and I think perennially, it's one of those states that's always at the bottom when when you think about all the educational. Um, uh, measures. Uh, but but I would tell everyone that we all, we don't have any control over the lot that we've been given or that we were born in, but we can make the lot. We can use our um, little lot that we have in life to make it better for others. And, you know, I can say this is that Ohio State has been, it's one of the great intellectual installations in the world. Uh, what makes me stay there? And some people always, you know, saying, when are you going to leave? You won't leave. And I, I won't leave primarily because uh, first, I'm having fun. Two, um, it's one of the few places in America where I can, I feel like I can scale my dreams and aspirations. Uh, we're a flagship institution, but we're also the land grant institution. And so uh, with that, you know, that within our DNA that we wanna make sure that, uh, that education is possible for as many as possible. But there's a tension, it's an ongoing tension when you're the flagship and the land grant between the two. You know? uh, but what I will say to everyone, if a little boy like me who grew up in the rural South and hanging out in his you know, two brothers who bought a, nearly a hundred acres of land, I used to try to see over the horizon and imagine. And I, I must say that my mentors, starting with my parents, they could see things that I couldn't see. Uh, and I tell anyone in this journey, you have to conquer loneliness. 
uh, because loneliness will sometimes stifle what the possibilities may be for you. You have to conquer fear of the unknown. You have to embrace fear in a way that that it channels you. What is some of the, the some of the most receiving this award is very humbling. Uh, it said it shows that the work that we're doing is possible and people are recognizing. It. As I said to you, we had over conservatively offered serve probably about 6,000 undergraduate students. And we had almost 2,500 uh, students who made the Dean's Great. List. The university's history, we've only had nine Rhodes Scholars, but two of the last four Rhodes Scholars come out of my office. Two weeks ago, one of my students was the first Black student to become a Truman Fellow. See, see, I know you can create something special that can stand the test of time. And the big laboratory before I even got into the academic space is being a student athlete. Where I went to, where I went to high school, we we're a powerhouse football team. Some would say one of the best in the United States, a Nike sponsored school, working class community, but uh, you'll see 12,000 people in the stand. Our band is the biggest Ohio State band, uh, it's community, right? And, and the community supports, they wrap themselves around you. Uh, and what I learned through sports, and I didn't talk about my coaches, the best teams I ever been on in my life, even with in my parents, I like to see my family as a team, is where everybody's contributions can be seen. When I won a state championship in football as a freshman in football and then won it in basketball, I always reflect, what did I enjoy the most? Not necessarily being one of the best players on the team or the best. It was seeing that all my teammates got to play and they had the same joy. And so one of the things I learned being a leader at Ohio State, how do you bring to bear everybody's talents where they can see all their talents and their contributions where they can have buy-in and right now I have, I like to think we have an office in our office of diversity and inclusion where everybody is all leaning in. They see what we can do. And the first thing I would tell presidents is before you try to get people externally to believe in you, get the people internally that you come in contact with every day. Because if they believe, that's where the possibility occurs and that's where all the magic occurs from my standpoint. As a, as a helping professional who train counselors, masters and PhD. But, bef, you know, the profession didn't find me, I guess, how I was shaped. I put a high premium on people and relationships and helping them believe that they can do it because, and, and that's what I believe that has been helpful. And it's helped us even when we don't always have the resources to do the things that we do. And some people can't believe We've had a lot of universities who reach out to us and they're looking for the magic bullet. Uh, but you have to have a formula. And in our office, we have a people's plan. How do we develop people? How do we develop students? How do we develop ourselves? How do we foster a culture of continuous improvement? And I think that helped me as a student athlete. Uh, that helped me get to the level that I, of greatness as a student athlete, because I was always trying to find a way to improve. And to be honest with you, this work called faculty and administration life, it saved my life. It gave me a new purpose. When you spend your whole life trying to get to a next level and you realize that you're not gonna be able to make it, you experience a form of social death and not knowing that I would, I mean, realizing that my NFL dream was coming to an end I had to find something to channel, to anchor myself. That was something was bigger because sports, when you play sports, it is bigger than you because no one don't think you can do it until you do it. And I think going back to my mentor, Dr. James Scott King, everything is full circle. He said, you're more than that football, Jamie, James Moore, you're more than that football. And now I can bear witness that I understand what he was talking about. You, you certainly have, you have found a bigger field. You have looked over that horizon with the help of your family and your mentors. 
And now you're helping others do the same thing. Passion, purpose, and most of all people. Uh, the, the, the recipe is not simple, uh, but it is evident. And everything that you've, you have done leading up to this moment has been testament to that. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's, it's clear to all of us uh, why we're so honored at ACE to be able to present the Reginald Wilson Diversity Leadership to Dr. James L. Moore III. Uh, he is more than deserving. Uh, he is an inspiration to all of us. Uh, and uh, Dr. Moore, thank you for all of your work. Uh, it's um, really a great, a great honor to be with you today. And I, I look forward to many more opportunities uh, to advance this conversation and advance, advance the mission that we both so passionately believe in. So thank you all for being here. Dr. Moore, congratulations once again, and um, all be well. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much.